You are now tuned in to Hollywood Ways with Doug and Breezy. Oh, hey, Ted. All right, welcome to Hollywood Ways. I'm Doug Ellen. We got a great guest coming up, but just a little update. First draft of this new show is done, and I'm going independent. As I said before, I have locked down two Golden Globe nominated actors and Emmy nominated actors as well. So I'm pretty excited and they're going to work real cheap. I'm going to keep them on. But anyway, we got a showrunner who's also uh, an entrepreneur and uh, really is doing a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about on this show. So I think it's a great story to talk about. But Bentley Evans, how you doing? I'm fantastic, man. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for coming in. Have you done a lot of podcasts or no? Uh, I think two. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, and I love it. Yeah, did you like it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny how this new world is going, and everybody's got one. So I'm surprised you're not like, oh, I have three podcasts myself. Like, no, I don't have one. I didn't get in the space. I did Russell Peters, and I did one with Terrell Owens. Oh, I did Terrell's also. Yeah, yeah. what'd you think? That was good. I had a good time with yeah. those guys, man. I did too. They were yeah. fun. Yeah. Although I told you know I play a lot of this sport pickleball. Do you know what this is? Because I heard you have a tennis court. I do. Jamie Fox is playing pickleball, and he's trying to sell me on. It. He's telling me I should turn my tennis court into a pickleball court. Hundred percent. Really? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the greatest game ever, and I've uh, you know I'm trying to been trying to tell our producer Ted Foxman to do that for a long time. I'm building one. It's the plans are in with permitting right now. All right, exciting, exciting. But yeah, I play I I, I play with some of the best guys in the country, and we were talking about our age as we're getting close to uh, 50. Bentley is as sick as that <laughs> is, but uh, it's a sport you can you can play pretty you know competitively at a later age than I think tennis. So okay. Anyway, we should check it out. We'll get you we'll get you on the court. So what's going on with you? You you show ran Martin, you I just found out we're in one of my favorite movies of all time, The Hollywood Shuffle, the Robert Townsend and and I guess Keenan did too, which I knew Keenan was in it. I didn't know he wrote the script as well. But yeah. uh, tell me how you got started in this business. You're from Oakland and and what was the beginning of it? Well I'm I'm born in the Bay. I'm raised in LA. I did all my school time right here at LA and um, never really had a desire to do anything other than this. I, I thought maybe I wanted to be in real estate following in the footsteps of my dad, but wasn't in the cards. Uh, I do a lot of kids, uh, Todd Bridges. <laughs> Remember him from different schools? Of course I do, yeah. Wait, what do you do what with Todd Bridges? Well, he, was, he grew up in my neighborhood, so it was like, you know, seeing him on TV and seeing this rise with him and Gary Coleman, you know, you, you kind of wanted to do that. And I had another friend that was in the Die Hard movie, uh, this kid named DeVorier White. And he was, that was on, the limo driver. He was the limo yeah, driver. You yeah. got it. You got it. And he was like one of my best friends in school. So Argyle. I, Argyle. That's right. On, on head of the class. And I never wanted to, you know, tell him that I wanted to be in the business because you didn't want to rain on his parade or you would have stopped getting the invites. Right. <laughs> so but I really secretly wanted to be in the business my, you know, my whole time in high school and stuff. And so after high school, I did the junior college tour so I went from West LA to Santa Monica to El Camino and it was like okay this college shit's not working out for me, man. <laughs> it's just not gonna work and so a friend of mine introduced me to Robert Townsend just on a whim and said man we should be actors man we, we should get in, in show business and I was like actors that that don't even sound right well, that sounds corny how the heck are we going? where do you sign up for acting <laughs> so you're not doing theater you're not writing in high school nothing no man my yeah. sister was like the the theater person <laughs> and i thought it was corny and it was like nah i'm not doing that but i really w wanted to do it but just too ashamed to, or embarrassed to you know uh, put my ego aside and do it and so um you know but once i met robert i set foot on the set of hollywood shuffle we were shooting not far from here. And when I walked on the set, I knew that I had to do this with this type of environment for the rest of my life. And Robert handed me the script. Now, as stupid as it sounds, he hands me the script to Hollywood Shuffle. Uh, he says, read it from cover to cover. <laughs> in so front said, of him. In front of him. That's what I do. I just made Kevin Connolly <laughs> read his, my script in front of me. So. That's, that's right. Kevin, yeah. read the script, man. <laughs> so I, I, I read this thing from cover to cover. And... Robert's like, what do you think? I said, wow, you you put these words on the paper? And he goes, yeah, that's writing. And I was like, that's what I want to do. He goes, ah, slow down, buddy. It's a lot that you have to do before you can just do that. Uh, what you should do, just do is continue to help me out as a PA in a sense, and I'll, I'll show you the ropes. And basically I spent two years with Robert, never got a paycheck. I did everything they asked me to do. and But that's unbelievable to get – involved with someone who's going to do something that good. And again, like let's talk Hollywood shuffle, which we've mentioned on this podcast a couple of times, which 
like I said, independent movie. I think it cost $100,000 and, and made Robert Townsend's career and got all of them, Keenan and uh, David Allen Greer and others, rolling after that movie. Absolutely. But when you read it, obviously it was making a statement that's pretty relevant today as well about the, the parts and the availability to roles for African-American actors. So when you were reading it, were you like, oh, this is something more than just a funny comedy? Or what did you think? No, because I was too young to really understand the statement that it was making. I just thought it was funny. Now, of course, watching it afterwards, of course, you saw it and saw it in uh, on the big screen and you realize, wow, this is a statement. But when you're when we're making it, it was just a lot of fun. It was like trying to find myself. What am I going to do with my life? And so. No, I didn't. I didn't look at it, you know, from the uh, intellectual side of it. I looked at it from a comedic uh, side. And and going back and seeing it years later, I do realize what was happening. Now, once we finished and I started furthering my career as an actor, then I then I saw the relevance of the film. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, everybody who hasn't seen this movie, you need to watch it immediately. And I, I, I've said it before. So we rent this movie in college. At the time when, you know, if you don't bring your VHS tape back, you know, that, remember they would yeah. fine you like a thousand bucks. Yes. And I swear to you, I used to get high every night in college and watch this movie for probably a hundred days in a row. I knew every single line of it. And to find out that you were one of the, the killer pimps in that scene is, is pretty wild now. But everybody should check this movie out. But your introduction to Hollywood, which is amazing. You meet Robert Townsend. I didn't get that, that lucky when I started. And he starts really letting you into the whole process and the whole thing, how it goes. Yeah, it, you know, because it was an independent film, so there were no rules, there was no studio, there was nobody to tell him what to do. So he kind of just did it his own way. So had it been a studio film, there's no way I would have got the keys to the castle to see the behind the scenes. I mean, literally, I was taking the tape rolls, the film rolls, and taking them to have them developed in the middle of the night and they're telling me you better get there <laughs> and you call me when you get there from a payphone and let me know yeah, don't lose that, that all that stuff so that's awesome yeah it was i was doing all of that stuff and i mean we had no permits to shoot the movie we're on standing on corners with walkie talkies letting them know when police cars are coming and stuff and shut it down it's a college film that's what we're saying <laughs> you know so it was, it was a lot of fun and do you realize you're working with i mean you know keen and david allen i forget who else is in it i mean these are some of the great comedy guys of the next 20 30 years that yeah. follow did you realize how good they were at the time well you knew they were good but you didn't know who they were you, we didn't know who damon wayans was yet we didn't know who john witherspoon was other than the fact that we had seen him on the richard pryor show years uh prior to that but we still didn't know the magnitude of the actors and actresses we were working with on that on that show and so many of them paul mooney they've gone on to do big 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 things in their careers so no it was just a lot of fun and very funny people but while we were making it a lot of them were doing stand-up uh at this little place we used to go to called uh the Comedy Act Theater, where Robin Harris, where his career was spawned from. Wow. So you, you would see them do their stand-up, but you knew you were a part of something special. That's great. And then, okay, so you do this two years with Robert, and, and then what? What's your next move? Uh, well, shoot, the next move was the, the, the one good thing that came out of that was Robert said, I never paid you, I couldn't pay you, but I'm going to get you your SAG card. And I knew enough about what a SAG card was to be excited about that. So that was... A fair exchange, but then when the sh when the movie sold to Samuel Goldwyn Company, all the actors got Taft Heart lead, and we also got um, I think I I got the biggest check that I had ever seen in my life, which was probably like maybe twenty five hundred bucks or something like that, and it just blew my mind. I went and bought a car and all kinds of stuff, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. Um, but then after that, um, I got to be Keenan's stand-in on I'm gonna get you sucker, <laughs> right? Right. And, of course, I got a speaking role in the movie that ended up on the editing room floor. But I got a check. <laughs> and so, you know, I got a chance to do that. And then that kind of sealed my relationship with the Wayans family. And then so Sean and Marlon, they come to town and we become fast friends. And from that point on, I was an honorary Wayans, you that's, know. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and, yeah. and so what are you trying to do? Are you trying to act exclusively or are you starting to write as well? No, you know, I wanted to write at that point in time, but I was acting because I was always told that this is the way that you get on the sets and you get the scripts and you meet the producers by acting. <laughs> and then you can parlay that into the whole writing. A thing. real career. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 here's the thing. I started booking roles, man, as an actor. Uh, there was 
you know, I'm a gangly looking kid. I'm 18, 19 years old. I'm 6'5". I'm getting every basketball role that I go up for, <laughs> but I can't play ball. <laughs> right. Right. And so, but I'm getting the roles and everything and really starting to make a name for myself around town with the casting directors. And then I end up getting a, a big audition where I'm screen testing against a guy named Martin Lawrence. And for what? For this show called A Little Bit Strange. And Martin and I were up for the same role. Now, <laughs> you know, Martin's five foot seven. I'm six foot five. Why are we up for the same role? I have no clue. But we were up for the same role, and he ends up, ends up getting the role. But we became friends at this audition. So it was kind of like, you You're know, just a likable guy because not everybody becomes friends with everybody at these things. Usually there's competition between the actors trying to get the same role. So how do you become friends at, a, at an audition where you're competing for it? So it was, it was interesting. So, you know, you remember the, the days, I, I think they still do it, when you screen test, you're there all day. Yeah. And so they make you sign a contract and you're there waiting for them to make the decisions. And I remember Martin coming over to me and saying, hey, man, what are you doing for lunch? And I was like, I, I don't have any plans. And I was like, that's nice. Because I knew who he was already. He was doing stand-up, yeah. and he had done What's Happening Now. And so I knew who he was. And he said, you want to go to Taco Bell? I was like, yeah, let's, you know, let's go get the tacos, right? It's taquitos. So we go to Taco Bell. And uh, from that point, you know, Martin's like, man, I'm new in town. I don't know anybody here. And I'm like, well, why don't you come over to my parents' house for uh, Thanksgiving? <laughs> he comes over, and we just hit a, a solid friendship. And what happens when he gets that part? Um, so he called me and he said, I just want you to know I got the role. I'm just letting you know. But it was unfair. His manager was one of the producers. <laughs> you know, they had it all. You it know, was they, loaded the, from the beginning. Come on, man. It was loaded. So, um, But he was still grateful for the Thanksgiving invite. Yeah. Even though he stole your career. Was, he, stole, he stole that. <laughs> but but uh, he did make me a promise that day. And you don't see this happening too much. He said, whichever one of us makes it first, we're going to look out for the other one. Wow, I said, man. I like that. I like that. And... So as you know, as as it would be, he ends up getting the opportunity to do a TV series, Martin, and he comes to me and he says, "What year is this? Because weren't you in House Party too?" Yeah, so I was in House Party. We shot House Party in '89. Is that before this or after? This, this is before that. This is before that. So we do we do House Party in yeah '89 comes out in '90, and uh, let's see what happened. Oh, I know. So. I do. Oh, I'll tell you another one, too, that we did uh, before that, too. So after we do House Party in 89, Martin has a huge role. I have a small role, but I'm hanging out on set every day. I'm getting to know Reggie Hutland and everybody. And so I'm really going after my acting career at this point. And I'm going, I can do this. So then right after that, both Martin and I were up for this other TV series for ABC that Keenan Ivory Wayans had written called Hammer, Slammer and Slade. And it was a spinoff of the movie, uh, I'm going to get you sucker. Well, I was Damon's understudy, and that was the role that I was up for. So I said, I know all the lines, everything, right? And so Martin and I booked this series together where he's playing this character, Willie, and I'm playing Lenny. And we're th these two bumbling idiots that are fences for these, uh, you know, for, the, for these, uh, you know, these street thugs. And so it, you know, had Jim Brown in it and. Isaac Hayes and Bernie Casey, a bunch of people, a bunch of these old old time guys. And so we did the role together. Show doesn't get picked up. The greatest. So you just thing. did a pilot. We just did a pilot for ABC. And it aired, but we didn't go any further because Keenan was focusing his career on uh in Living Color. Right. So uh it didn't happen. Michael Schultz, the great Michael Schultz directed it. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. But Martin and I really, really sealed our friendship on that you know, through that experience. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, I, so just house party stuff. My career was, I was, I was driving. I think I was a PA on house party two, I think. Ah. And I drove uh, Helen Martin. Did you, you must've worked with Helen. I worked years, with right? Helen. Yeah. So yeah. Helen, who I ended up getting in, you know, just so, cause we're going to get into uh, Bentley's, story of, of entrepreneurship and starting your own business but I start I did my first short film and I was driving around Helen Martin and I told her I said I'm doing this short film 
um, would you be in it? Which I don't even know if it was appropriate for the PA who was driving <laughs> her, but Helen Martin was in, you know, 227 mm-hmm. and a, a million things. Everything. I mean, you'd recognize her from everything, including obviously Hollywood Shuffle. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if she was on Martin ever, but she. She never did Martin. She never did uh, an episode of Martin, but I, did we have her on Jamie Foxx show? One of those shows we had her on. But she, she was so great. But anyway, I got her to do my short film with Ernie Hudson and David Schwimmer before Friends and Johnny Silverman and a couple other people. So that's how, how my career got started. So mm-hmm. you, you got to make those relationships, you know, as you're going. But so you then. Martin is going to go do his own show. And, yeah. and, and when does your writing career start? I haven't heard anything about writing. Okay, so so uh, this this agent that I had at the time, uh, this guy named Desmond Gums, and he he uh, he kept telling me, man, you know what? In your in your downtime when you're not auditioning, you know what you should do? You should write like some commercials and write like Burger King jingles and stuff like that. And I, at one point, I wanted to be a singer, and at one point, I wanted to write songs. So I started writing these little commercials and I would have my mom type these little scripts up and stuff. <laughs> and so then he would say, you should watch what's on TV and write scripts. So I started in my spare time just writing scripts. I'm still living at home with my mom and dad. For shows you liked. Oh yeah, for sure. Everything that was on the air that I liked, I'm like, oh, let me see if I can write a version of that. So I would call the studios and have them mail me scripts. And I started writing my own scripts. So now it's very interesting. You said House Party 2. Uh, they were shooting at Union Station. Remember that? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> well, Martin was Martin was shooting at Union Station, and the day before he was doing a scene, he we, he and I went to a Clippers game, and that's that's a faux pas. I'm a Laker fan, but anyway, <laughs> I digress. We're going to the uh, to the the Clippers game, and on the way, Martin says to me, "Hey, man, you know, they're talking. HBO's talking about doing something with me with my career." They want to do some sort of show. If it happens, I don't want you to say that I didn't look out. So tell me now, do you want to audition? Do you? I mean, what do you want to do? And I said, if you really want to help me out, I want to be a writer. And he said, what? <laughs> he said, I said, a writer. He goes, come on, his exact words. He says, come on, man, that's what the white guys do. You, 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 <laughs> I swear to God, that's what he said. And I said, no, that's what I want to do. I Very want to be racist. a writer, yeah. man. Get so, Helen Martin's PA. Exactly. He's driving him. <laughs> So, so um, he says, all right, man, well, you know, you got to show me something. So the next day I take him a bunch of scripts that I had written to Union Station. He's shooting House Party 2. I leave him in his dressing room. He calls me the next day on a Saturday, and he says, I'm sorry, bro. I had no idea. I didn't know you were this talented. Come to my house. I want to go over these scripts with you. And so that was the beginning, and then he introduces me to Chris Albrecht over at uh, – over at HBO. Who made my career, by the way. See, and Chris gave me a shot. He wasn't very friendly to me at first. <laughs> He's never friendly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But um, he takes me in, and and so, you know, as it would happen, uh, Martin says, Bentley wrote this script that I want to do as my series. And they're like, no, that's not going to happen. We're going to introduce you to the writer that's going to do your show, John Bowman. But if something happens, maybe we'll make Bentley a trainee, a Writers Guild trainee or something. I'm gung-ho, like, yeah, yeah. And Martin's like, nah, nah. He's going to be a writer on the show. So, you know, he he took me that extra step wow. and made sure that they put me in a position where I could really grow fast. I mean, that, what a great story to have. You know, obviously, either of you could have hit first, but to have it kind of be a team that really looks out for each other. Yeah. So then the show gets created. Does John, Bo- I don't remember. Does Bowman yeah. create it? Bowman created it. Uh, Bowman uh, got created by credit. Martin did. And Topper Carew, who was Martin's uh, manager at the time. Mm-hmm. And so the three of them split the created by. And from that point on. Were you involved with writing the pilot at ab- all? Absolutely. Right. From day one, the only writer that ever did the show out of maybe 30 writers, I was the only one from the beginning to the to the end. So are you pissed? No, no, not, not necessarily because, um, you know, I didn't know the business at the time, and it's okay. It's like um, I was involved in it, but I still was very green to the business, and I just wanted to help out yeah. where, wherever I could help. And, you know, Chris made sure that I got everything that I deserved before we finished the show. So, All right, good. I mean, you know, it's, it's speaking to the same thing that we're doing now, which going out, doing your own stuff, which, you know, if you can figure it out when you're young, like Robert Townsend did when he was, I don't know, how old was he when he did Hollywood Shuffle? He was 28. 28, and then Keenan was 27. Yeah, even even younger doing that. So I think that's great. So uh, I want to get into like more of uh, this entrepreneurial stuff that you're doing now, producing and, and directing. So we'll be back right after this. Yeah.
All right, welcome back, Hollywood Ways. I was just, you know, in, in between the break, I'm just thinking about that, you know, and, and sometimes you go, oh, you don't get lucky enough. But the truth is, is when I did that short film with Helen Martin, I did it with David Schwimmer before Friends. And the second Friends hit, obviously, we know, became a worldwide phenomenon instantaneously. And David, there was part of us, we used to joke around, oh, we're going to be like Scorsese and De Niro of comedy, whatever. And, uh, and the first thing David did was get me uh, a screenplay sold to Miramax. So... When you can, you know, A, when your creative uh, abilities align, but B, you're working with good people who actually are true to their words. I, I, it's pretty rare in Hollywood, but I think it's interesting that both of us had that experience. So I just want to go a little further with, with Martin. Um, so what, what else, how else does he help this career get going? Yes. This is Martin Lawrence we're talking about. Yeah, you know, uh, rarely do you hear those great stories about what somebody did for someone else. and. I can tell you that, you know, this guy was like an angel in my career. Uh, he took it to a level that I could have never gotten to by myself or it would have taken a long time. What he did was in the process of them trying to put this Martin show together, which they didn't even have an idea yet. But Martin calls me and says, look, man, I'm going to 20th Century Fox. We're going to be on the lot. You need to come with me to this meeting. So I ride with him to Fox and you know, I'm blown away by the offices and everything. It's just, you know, it's a mind fuck. You know, it's crazy. And we get to this office, and I don't remember who was the president at Fox at that time, but we get there. I think it was maybe Peter Roth. And we get there, and we go into this room, uh, this office, and there's a secretary, and she says, uh, Martin, they're waiting for you. Your friend can wait here outside. So <laughs> Martin says, what are you talking about? He can wait outside. And I said, hey, man, no, it's cool. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll wait here. He goes, no, 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 no. What, what are you talking about? He can't come in. So she says, well, let me get Mr. Albrecht. So he, she goes in and she gets Chris Albrecht and he comes to the door. I had never seen him before. And he's got this little, this little <laughs> sergeant type of attitude. He goes, Martin, what's up? They're, they're waiting for you. What's going on? He goes, yeah, they said that my friend can't come in. And he goes, yeah, well, he can't. I mean, you, he's going to sit right, right here. <laughs> so Martin says, Hey, fuck that, Chris. These exact words. He says, if he doesn't come in this fucking room, I'm not coming in the room. Now, that's just what it is. And so Chris is like, all right, well, <laughs> bring him in. So now, Real now, entourage there. Right. So now I'm in this room, and it's all these execs. Everybody's got on suits and ties. And there's John Bowman, who actually ultimately created the show, and Martin's uh, manager, Topper. And they're all sitting there. And Martin says, yeah, so this is Bentley, and he's going to create my show. And they said, no, no, that's not how it works here, Martin. He's not going to create your show. So they put me on, on, on blast. They were like, so what have you written so far? And I said, well, you know, I got a, I got a spec script for Cosby. <laughs> uh, Keenan's talking about letting me write some sketches on In Living Color. I mean, I got a couple of things, and they were like, yeah, okay. So, but I'm looking at Martin. I'm trying to read him, and he's angry. He's not happy about this at all. So after the introduction to John and John kind of introduces the idea of what the Martin show could be, uh, Martin's in agreement. Everybody's in agreement. I'm quiet, sitting back. And so we leave. Now, when we're, when we're, when we're leaving the lot, Martin's not speaking to me the whole time walking to the car. And we get to the car and I said, hey, man, look, I really appreciate what you did, man. But don't don't fuck up your opportunity trying to look out for me. And he looked at me. And he, he pointed, he poked me in the chest with his finger and he said, fuck you. Don't ever say nothing like that for, to me. I'm looking out for you. Don't, don't ever, don't ever, you know, look at me and say that you, you don't, because maybe you don't want it. He said, maybe you don't want it. I'm looking out for you. So you go with me. If I say this is what we're doing, you ride with it. And I got, it was a valuable lesson because I didn't really understand what he was saying until later on. He was basically saying, I'm looking out for you. This is I'm bringing you along for the ride. So, but I you, think he was also saying because I think that's what some people mistake that a friendship can just lead to work. I think he was also saying, "I believe in you. You better believe in yourself." And the fact that he was that confident with it when they're bringing all these professional writers in front of him is is amazing. You know? Yeah. And I feel the same way. You know, Schwimmer did the same thing. He got he got to host SNL. He's like, yo, you want to come with me and uh, you'll you'll punch up sketches. Now it went a little different in our meeting because we got to SNL and uh, 
I was in the writer's room with them, but nobody was talking to me, and there was no conversation like, no, no, my guy's writing everything. That didn't happen. But I think the fact is David believed in me before possibly I even believed in myself, and I think it's the same with you. So it's, it's amazing that Martin was that confident with it. He you know? was, and I had that same experience. He took me to do Saturday Night Live with right. him. And I, I I went through the whole thing with Sandler and 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 uh, uh, Chris and and uh, you know all of, all of the guys. Dave Chappelle was there as a writer at the time wow. in the writers' room, and and uh, so I went through that experience. And some of my sketches actually made it, but that was a tough room with Lauren Michaels. That was a tough room. Yeah, but yeah. that's cool though. I mean, I, I just think I, I just think it's a great story. And then you got involved with with Jamie Foxx too, like at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what, Jamie? Uh, I I got a deal over at Warner Brothers while I was doing the Martin Show. Uh, my agents said. Hey, we're gonna get you this this overall deal. I didn't even know what an overall deal was. I was like, "Oh, great! That sounds good. <laughs> overall, great. Okay." So they take me on the tour. I go see every studio head in LA, and we landed Warner Brothers. And they said, "Hey, look, we want to do a deal with you." So they offered me this two year deal. And the first person's name I saw on the roster was Jamie Fox. I had met Jamie a few times, but I knew he was making a name for himself on In Living Color. And I said, that's the guy I want to work with. And they were like, yeah, well, you know what? He, we already have him with another showrunner. <laughs> another white guy. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. There's a look, look for somebody else. And I was like, can you just set up a meeting with me? Can I just get a meeting with him? So they set me up with him and his uh, managers. And, you know, I went in the, in the meeting and, you know, I could tell he wasn't feeling me at all. <laughs> right. He was so quiet. So I just, I said, hey, I'm not getting the gig. So I'm just going to say whatever the fuck I want to say. And I was like, hey, man, you know what? I do this shit for Martin, man. You know, you're probably not feeling me, man, but, you know, I'm the best that could, you know, the best person, you know, candidate to write a show for you. But if you don't see that, man, whatever. And so I leave the meeting and my agent calls me and, and he said, hey, what, what happened in that meeting? I said, man, I fucked up. And he goes, no, no, no. They want to see you again. Jamie says, come back to Warner Brothers now. So I come back down Barham and I meet Jamie in the parking lot at Warner Brothers and he's like, Hey, man, you said something that was really interesting to me in that meeting. And I said, what was that? He goes, I liked your confidence, and you said something that I couldn't really relate to. I said, what was it? He goes, you said that you didn't grow up poor. You grew up rich. I said, well, you know, if I can, if, can I say this on the air? I said, what I said to him was, I grew up nigger rich, which is black people rich, but that ain't really rich. That's like, you're doing good for black folks, but that's not really good. So you can say it. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I can't <laughs> I, react. I, I'm, I'm I can't uncomfortable even, just yeah, listening. I don't even, I, I'm just pretending I didn't hear anything. <laughs> so, so what did he say to that? So, so he said, he said, man, you know, I grew up really, really poor and I've never really talked to anybody who had your story. You said your father drove Lincoln Continentals and stuff. I said, yeah, man, we didn't, I don't know that experience. I never lived in the projects we lived in what they call Black Beverly Hills now. That's where I came up. And he was like, I love that about you, man. I think we can do something together. Wow. And so from that day on, we started developing for Warner Brothers. So your black privilege helped See, you. my black privilege helped me, <laughs> see? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, and then you start, you, did you create that show? Or? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I created the show with Jamie. Um, um, I started writing drafts of ideas and everything that I turned in, he hated right away. And then he said, you know, I, I just want to do something about a hotel. And I said, what else? He goes, you figure that out. <laughs> and so I just started jotting down ideas and coming up with treatments and synopsises. And finally he says, I like that. Put the characters together. And I put the characters together. We go into David Janilari over at Warner Brothers at the time. And he goes, I love this. Let's, let's take this thing out. So now we take it to ABC, NBC, CBS, the WB, which had just started. ABC makes us the first deal. They said, "Hey, look, we'll we'll do the show. We'll do a we'll do a pilot script deal with you." And so WB comes and says, "We'll do a guaranteed six episodes on air guarantee." And I was like, "That's we got to do that." Jamie's managers, "No, no, we want to be with ABC." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no. Let's be the big fish in the small pond over here at the WB. We'll last for 5 years." And that's what happened. And what what had he done at that point, Jamie? Jamie had done he had, he had only done In Living Color. Uh, he had done a, a sitcom called Rock that he got fired from, but he was very <laughs> funny on there. And he had done the movie Booty Call. Right. Yeah, at that time. So he wasn't the massive star that we know today. Oh, no, Oscar no. Winner. He no, had no. just gotten started. And so no. you work with him for five years on this show. Yeah. Do you think, like, I'm working with 
<laughs> a guy who's going to be a legend, a guy who can do anything? Or are you like, yeah, he's funny, he's great for this part? Or what are you thinking? I had no idea he'd be who he is today. However, I did know that he was immensely talented. Um, he used to do imitations of everybody. And before he did Ray, he wanted to do Marvin Gaye. And he does a spot-on Marvin Gaye impression. But uh, he ended up doing Ray. But where he really broke out was when he did Any Given Sunday. And I had to create a schedule that would allow him to free up from from the show to go do that movie because Oliver Stone, oh, those stories are crazy. <laughs> but Oliver Stone was like, no, we don't want you. You're a sitcom star and we don't want you. So so basically I had to help, you know, kind of tailor this, you know, this uh, schedule to, to work it out. And we were successful in doing that. So he could get away for a month and go shoot and then come back and then go shoot. And it worked out for him. And that's what made him a big star any given Sunday. Yeah, I mean, and uh, did you? So you got Oliver Stone stories behind the scenes of what it was like with him? Or oh what? yeah, you know, Jamie tells the greatest stories about how he had to audition for the role uh, six times, and every time he came in there, you know, Oliver Stone would say, "You throw throw a football like a bitch. You're not <laughs> getting this role. You're a sitcom star. I don't think you're funny. You're not even good." You know, he just he just tore him up. You know, he's snorting coke and shit in the meetings and stuff <laughs> like that. And so, you know, it, just, it takes Fox to tell the stories because he's absolutely the greatest storyteller I've ever met in my life yeah i mean he's he's amazing it's i watched those videos of him doing 15 different impressions yeah. in 30 seconds it's mind-boggling how yeah. talented it is all right well we're going to talk about some of your talents when we come back and uh we'll be right back after this all right welcome back hollywood ways and uh bentley evans so what i really want to talk to you about is you know tyler perry's built this production studio in atlanta that's like a billion dollar industry and you're doing this, or we're doing it, even before him here. So I want to hear about that. Well, you know, the thing about Tyler, uh, um, he, I met Tyler Perry uh, some years ago. At, he was doing a show at the Kodak Theater. And I had been hearing about this guy out of Atlanta that's doing these black stage plays uh, on the Chitlin circuit, and he's making millions of dollars. And I read that he made $50 million dollars. And so it got my mind thinking. I'm going, whoa, 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 50 million. What the hell? What am I doing with my life, right? <laughs> and so, so Tyler is like, uh, I, I get an invite to go see him at the Kodak. So I go see this stage play. I'm sitting in the audience, and I'm going, this is some bullshit. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I'm not knocking what Tyler's doing, but I'm going, it's so simple. And basically, it's, it's the Jamie Foxx show. It's a hotel, and he's just doing like a, college reunion with this character Madea so I watch it it's 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 mildly entertaining but so I watch it and I'm having fun the audience is into it afterwards I go backstage and I stand in line to meet Tyler Perry so when I when I walk up to him I I shake his hand I say hey man I'm, I'm Bentley Evans I just wanted to say hello to you man and meet you and he goes I know who you are I said you know who I am how, how do you know me this is before Instagram and any social media so I'm like how do you know me he goes I've been following you I want to be just like you. And I said, well, I just read you made 50 million dollars. I'm trying to be like you. Let's switch places. Yes, exactly. <laughs> he goes, no, no, but you have something that I don't have, and that's TV. I want the TV. I said, well, you, you, know, you can't just pimp TV like that. That's a, that's a whole different thing. And he goes, watch me. So I'm walking away going, this dude's a trip. He's crazy if he thinks he could just walk into TV like that. Six months later, I'm watching, coming to TV, it's Tyler Perry's uh, <laughs> House of Pain. And I'm going, he fucking did it. How did that, how did that happen? Now, that one he did on his own, too, already? Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, he took his own money, and he invested it in himself. Uh, he created these episodes. I believe he shot 10 episodes. And he went to uh, a few different places to kind of shop it around. Wasn't a lot of people interested in it, but he had a deal with Lionsgate for his movies. So he said, Hey, look, you guys got to figure out a TV thing or I'm taking my movie somewhere else. So Lionsgate hired Debmar Mercury, uh, a syndication company. They bought that company for Tyler. And then they showed Tyler and Lionsgate how to distribute a show uh, on a syndicated uh, network. And so that's, that's how that whole thing happened. And they were able to strike a deal with Fox and TBS and, the next thing, you know, Tyler's got 100 episodes of that show, and then there's another show, and now he's just making shows, and hundreds and hundreds of episodes later. So were you looking at this model and going, okay, I want to do it in L.A., or what? Yeah, yeah. So, But not only that, I had to, I had to get the golden ticket to go 
to the to go to Tyler Perry studio so I could see for my own self. <laughs> What's going on back there? <laughs> but my agent calls and says, hey man, you know, you know any you know this Tyler Perry guy? I said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I met him. And he said, Look, they're doing something in Atlanta. I'll submit your name if you want to go down there and write some scripts or some shit. Well, at the time I was like, man, it's a writer's guild strike. I need some money. <laughs> so I go down to Atlanta. I go to Tyler's studio. This is his first studio before the massive one that he has now. But I go there and uh, I'm I'm impressed as <laughs> Tyler Perry Studios and water coming down the <laughs> sign. And so I'm like, what the hell? This is crazy. <laughs> and so I meet with Tyler. Uh, we have a good conversation. He says, hey, man, I'm doing this show, Meet the Browns. If you want to write some scripts while you're in town, hey, man, I'll pay you like, you know, 25000 a pop. I'm like, 50 grand? Yeah, hell yeah, I'm sticking around. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so I hung out in Atlanta for about three weeks. I'm working at Tyler Perry Studio every day. The rapport is great. He's great. I go back home. They send for me again. Now all of his employees, these other producers, they don't like me. <laughs> they're like, mm, he's too close with the boss. They don't, <laughs> they don't like me, so they're making everything difficult for me. Anytime I leave the studio, they're like, I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> we have food here in the cafeteria, my brother. You don't need to leave. Oh, it was, <laughs> Someone it was sees great. you walking out, you're never coming back in. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But they made it real difficult for me, but what it did do, it made me open up my eyes and see that I could do something like this myself. And then there was another gentleman I met in that same trip that had a studio outside of Atlanta, and he was making these independent shows, and he's the one that gave me the real confidence. He said, Bentley Evans, you can do this too. What is this, 2007? Where are we at? 2008. 2008. Yeah. So you come back and, and you go, okay, what? What's the move? You're raising yeah. money or, or what are you doing? Well, so no, when I when I come back, I just started like trying to come up with some ideas uh, based on some stuff that I saw as a kid. I loved Mary Tyler Moore, Moore show. And I said, maybe I'll do a Mary Tyler Moore show type of thing with a black lead. And I went to, to high school with Nia Long. Let me see if I can get Nia to come do this thing. So I called Nia. She's like, I'm with it. Let's do it. Of course, you know, lawyers kind of mess deals up and stuff like that. But I'm like, Nia, look, I don't have no money. I need you to come do this thing. I'm going to build these sets. And I contacted a friend of mine, Raphael Sadiq, and I, I partnered up with my business partner, this guy named Trent Gums. And I said, look, we could, we could really do this thing. And so Raphael said we could shoot at his music studio. So we made sets in a music studio. We built set walls in a garage. So you have no distributor whatsoever. You're making this independent TV show. Nothing. Okay. We said, if you build it, they will come. And so I got a couple of dollars that I scraped up, and I was at the Lakers game, and I saw a producer named Jeff Franklin. Do you know Jeff Franklin? I, he's, he's my ex-wife's cousin. But yeah. Oh, is he really? Yeah, full house. Yeah. So Jeff is at the Lakers game, and I see him at halftime. I said, Jeff, what's up? And he was like, hey, what's going on? I said, you, you want to get back into TV? He goes, ah, I, don't, I don't know. I said, no, 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 <laughs> let's, let's talk. So he, he asked me to come up to the house. I'm sure you know the yeah, house. Yeah, the Manson house. <laughs> the Manson house. <laughs> it, is the, it is on the property where the Manson yeah. murders house. Yeah. yeah, the Helter Skelter house. Yeah. And so I go have lunch with Jeff, and he goes, what do you need from me? I said, you got a couple hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> <laughs> I know you got a couple hundred million from Full House. Right. You got a couple hundred you can give me? Or? Exactly. So he says, well, you know what? If you show me some scripts, maybe I'll get down with you. And I, I showed him 10 scripts. I said, I wrote all 10 of these scripts. I believe in it, Jeff. We can get this thing on. I, I tell him who Tyler Perry is. I'm trying to sell him on this whole thing. He says, well, I don't believe you can do 10 episodes. But if you say that you'll do four, do your best four out of the 10, and I'll give you a couple of hundred grand. Wow. Gave me a couple of hundred. You wired it into my account the next day. I was like, we're rolling, guys. Let's get these sets built. Is and it multicam? Multicam. So you shot four episodes of this multicam show with no distributor. Four episodes of this show. And Nia did it? Nia did not do it. So, so I found so the day that Nia was out, a friend of mine came to me and said, Do you know Tatiana Ali? Uh from Fresh Prince of Bel Air. And I was like, I've never met her. But I remember when she was a kid, I used to see her at the set all the time. So he says, You want to meet with her? So I'm thinking, the little girl from Fresh Prince, when she walked in the door at Jerry's Deli, I said, oh, God, damn, she's fine as hell now, right? And so she How old was she at that time? Uh, 25. 25 at that time. So, yeah, about uh, somewhere, or maybe a little later, maybe like 27, something like that. And so I explained to her what I'm doing. You know, she's a smart chick. She went to Harvard. She's a real sharp one. 
And she says, I get it. Let's partner on this thing. So I say, cool. So she comes on and we cast everyone else. And a lot of the people that we cast have gone on to do big things. But Tatiana was with it. And so we shot these four episodes and, you know, we were hustling. It was like, hey, man, look, we don't, we don't have any money, but we'll, uh, why don't we defer? You like the defer payments uh, uh, statement? Why don't we do this deferred payment? I learned what a deferred payment was. <laughs> it's like, we, we can do it, but we'll do it on defer. Yeah, it's layaway. Yeah, it's layaway, right? <laughs> so so, so <laughs> you shoot these four shows. You're, yeah. You were happy with the product? Yeah, I mean, I was, it was probably the most, I was the most proud of those four episodes out of anything else I had ever done. After the hundreds of episodes of Martin and Jamie, because I the pride was I did it myself. Yeah. And it was like a wake up, like, how the hell, why didn't you think of this before? Yeah. And, you know, cameras are cheap now. And so you could really get that same look. Uh, very, You could achieve the same thing very easily now. And so what do you do with it? What's the first move? So I shoot these four episodes. I get them edited. My editor had never edited anything before. <laughs> but I was like, you could do it. What we'll do you, figure where'd it out. you find him? He was a, he was a, a, a cousin of my partner, Trent. <laughs> so Richard Gums. And Richard was like, I guess I could do it. So we just, I said, I know what the shot should look like. And so Jeff helped us too. Jeff said, bring your editing, editing equipment up here to the Helter Skelter house and let's, <laughs> let's figure this let's out. Let's hope nobody gets hacked up and we'll just <laughs> fix this show. Exactly. So we spent a lot of time up there and he actually showed Richard how to really cut a sitcom. And we got these four episodes. We don't know what to do with them. Now I hook up with Byron Allen. You know who Byron yeah, Allen is? Yeah, of course. So I hook oh, up yeah. with Byron and Byron's like, hey, Bentley, yeah, I'll take them out for you, but uh, not going to give you any money. I'm like, I gotta pay these investors back. What are you talking about? He goes, "Hey, I don't know, but I need to. I need you to sign something, giving me the rights for two years." I was like, "Byron, are you out of your mind? I can't do that." So he's like, "Oh, I don't know what to tell you then." So I leave Byron, and I'm trying to figure out what to do with these things. And then a friend of mine <laughs> came to me and said, "Hey, what about TV One?" I'm like, "TV One, the little small cable station." He goes, "It's better than nothing." So he sets up a meeting. I fly. Me and Trent, we fly to uh, where Baltimore. Right. And we go there, and I'm telling the people, hey, man, look, we got these shows. And this lady, it's always, and it's always a black lady, too, with an attitude. She's like, <laughs> we ain't trying to do that Tyler Perry shit here. And I said, no, 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 this is not Tyler Perry stuff. This is, this is a good show that I created. And anyway, I had to sell her on it. She wasn't interested. She says, well, we don't have the money for that. I said, is that right? Well, how can you turn down free? And she says, free? What are you, what are you talking about free? I said, I'm willing to take a bet on my shows. I'll give them to you. You can play them for free. But if they hit a certain number, you guys just have to agree to do more. And so she, they said, okay, well, yeah, okay, we'll do that. So now we set up for this launch. TV One's going to do their little small marketing campaign. But what they did have was they had a radio station called Radio One. And a lot of people listened to it. So they used their radio stations to promote it. And when we premiered in 2010, January, it was the biggest thing that they had ever done on the network. And the, and the advertisers started coming in. They were like, can you make more? I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. So they ordered 26 more from me. Wow. And then it's like, okay, now we got this thing going on. And now we need to get some a place to shoot it because we were shooting at – uh, the guy that owns Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles, <laughs> he, he had this little space and he was letting us shoot there. Was he the cinematographer as well? No, he wasn't the cinematographer. <laughs> but he was just this old cat. Yeah, you guys can shoot over here. And he was like, yeah, it was just, it was a nightmare. We didn't like shooting there. So Trent came up with the idea, hey, man, look, let's, let's build our own studio. So when TV One says, hey, where are you going to shoot this? We were like, oh, uh, we have a place. Uh, just send us the money. We're going to pay for that. And we use that money to build our and studio. And did they give you a real budget? Yeah, they gave us. A, I mean, not in sitcom money. Bro, no, but, not yeah. But enough, to, enough, enough to make it worth your time and do it, and then yes. build the studio that you now have eleven years yes. later. Yes, that, that's unbelievable. So, how many episodes total did you do with that show? Sixty-five. I did sixty-five. We needed thirty-five more to get to that hundred mark, and they just weren't willing to go any further. But the sixty-five episodes are still playing, and. We're still receiving, you know, residuals and everything. That's, so it's that's cool. incredible. Yeah. And, and then now you got your own studio. So do you start going, okay, let's do it again and yep. again and again? Yep. And, yep. And, and how many times have you done this? Yeah. Oh, so I've done it again about six times. So I, I created this show uh, called Family Time. I take that over to this new network, Bounce TV, when it was starting. We ended up doing 91 episodes there. 
Then I did it again with this show called In the Cut. We ended up doing 87 episodes of that. Then I did it again with this show called Grown Folks, and we only did 13 episodes of that. And uh, you're in a position now, just because this is, I talk a lot about this on the show, a lot of times where people get tired of this business is dealing with all the execs, listening to all their stupid comments. When you started, like I did, um, in a world, like I was doing Fat Beach in 1992. Oh, Fat and Beach, I was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I rewrote and directed that movie. So get I, out of here. I was you doing didn't that. know that, did you? Uh, I did not. I, I did not. I was doing that movie when I was 22 years old, but nobody was telling me what I could do or not do. I was just doing, and uh -huh. it was great. The same on my shorts. And once you start getting into the system, you know, where everybody is telling you their thoughts and this and that. So have you maintained your ability for the last decade to just do whatever you want, whenever you want? No. So with TV One, I could do whatever I wanted to do. When I got into Bounce, it was like I was competing with their network execs. They hated me. They hated <laughs> the fact that I brought some content in there and gave it to them. They were like, oh, we love him, but we hate him because <laughs> we didn't come up with this. <laughs> we didn't come up with it. Right. So they made life uh, like real living hell to the point I used to just use it as an exercise to, just to test my patience and go, <laughs> okay, I'm not going to cuss her out today. Uh, I'm just not going to do it. And, um, you know, so I do all these episodes. They're giving me all these strenuous notes. And I'm going, guys, you guys do know that I've been doing this for a very long time, right? But they just, you know, were trying to belittle everything that I was doing. And we ended up getting close to 100 on both shows. But then going beyond, I'm doing this, this thing uh, with uh, MC Light uh, for the All Black Station, which is uh, uh, AMC Network. They don't, those execs, they just send me the money and say, turn in a product. And I love it. That's the best. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. I, I'm, I'm loving this. This is really like an amazing story. Um, I, I just, a lot of people don't understand like independent films that you can go make TV shows. Yeah. And you can go, you know, you still have to go find someone who will put it on and someone who will market it and help you with all that. But it sounds like it's going great. So what's, what's the next plans right now? Um, so th there's a few things. Um, obviously, I'm trying to take advantage of the relationships that I do have at some of these uh, streaming platforms uh, or networks or whatever, uh, whatever you want to call them, and get as much stuff as I can on there. However, I do have a network um, that I'm kind of launching myself. It's a digital network. It's a streamer as well uh, called NBT, and we're in the process of launching that. But we're kind of targeting our audience in the Caribbean because it's an underserved market. And we know that that's comedy that's comedy. Right. And they've never seen uh, content that's produced in a way that Americans produce TV, but using uh, utilizing the talent that's there in the Caribbean. So they see their own people uh, on television. And so that was our business model. And so far it's really starting to blossom into something. It's very cool. Yeah. I mean, what does NBT stand for? National Black Television. So it's for, like I said, the Caribbean, uh, certain parts of Africa. If it makes it way, its way here, great. It's, it's like it's direct competition with BET. Um, and so that's, that's exactly what our, our business slogan is, our business model. So, and have you heard from Tyler during this whole kind no, of run? No, no. I saw, I saw Tyler on a cruise ship uh, about three years ago, and – it wasn't the very, it wasn't a very friendly reception. It wasn't mean, but it was almost like, hey, you know, yeah. man. I was like, hey, no, you remember? No, yeah, you remember the studio? Yeah, it he, wasn't. He doesn't it, want you having a studio. Yeah, it wasn't the warm and fuzzies. But I mean, listen, what he's been able to do is 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 phenomenal. He's got a studio uh, that, in mass, it's bigger than Warner Brothers, Universal, and Paramount combined. <laughs> so sick. so it's it's pretty sick. When yeah, he did. he's got nothing to be angry about. He's no. got nothing to be uh, competitive about either. No. But um, well, Bentley, I really appreciate you coming in, man. Yeah, man. I mean, this is, uh, this is a, it's a great story, and I think it inspires people and motivates people to get off their ass and kind of do their own shit, which, uh, you know, producer Ted Foxman and I, we're going to do something ourselves right now. So uh, uh, I'm excited for that. But thank you for coming in, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Absolutely. I can't wait for us to work together, too, man. I want to work with you. I got an idea, actually. So. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about it. All right. Thank you. Can, can I produce? <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood Ways will be back next week uh, I don't know what Maybe we'll talk holiday movies or something while, while you're talking What is your favorite holiday movie We'll just throw that out as 
since we're approaching Christmas. My favorite holiday movie is, believe it or not, is Miracle on 34th Street. You know, it's funny because you said you were friends with the uh, guy from Die Hard. Yes. I thought you were going to say Die Hard, which is I, my favorite one. Christmas movie. But Everybody's Miracle on 34th been debating Street. whether that's even a Christmas movie. It's not even a debate. It's a ridiculous it's, debate. It's of course a it's a Christmas movie. movie. It it's a great family Christmas Indeed movie. Indeed it is. It's a little <laughs> violent, but you know, we love it. So, All right, thanks, Bentley. Thank great you. to talk to you. You are now tuned in to Hollywood Ways with Doug and Breezy. Oh, hey, Ted.